Hello there, I'm Julia Baird. Welcome to The Drum. Coming up... Unapologetic, Pauline Hanson stands by her comments about Muslim Australians and we'll look at the reaction to her maiden speech tonight. The Prime Minister breaks his ironclad promise on super reform. And the Chinese strongly deny they're buying their way into Australian politics. And joining me on the panel this evening, we have former Editor-in-Chief of The Australian and author of new book, Making Headlines, Chris Mitchell. Welcome. Thank you. Political editor of BuzzFeed Australia, Mark Stefano, joins us again. Now, he has his own book out called What a Time to Be Alive. Oh and former New South Wales Liberal Party Minister and fundraiser, Michael Yabsley. Welcome to you. Thank you. Now, if you're on Twitter, you can join us using the hashtag The Drum. Pauline Hanson has refused to apologise for her comeback speech to Parliament, where she warned Australia was at risk of being swamped by Muslims. The One Nation senator said anti-social behaviour was rampant in the Muslim community and fuelled by its hyper-masculine and misogynist culture. She called for an end to Muslim immigration and a ban on the, bur on the burqa and niqab. Islam senator... Hansen said was opposed to democracy. Now before we get into to get stuck into the political reaction, let's go to Melbourne. This is where President of Muslims for Progressive Values, Reem Swade, is with us. Reem, welcome to the drum. Hi Julia, thanks for having me. Now I want to ask you about your reactions to Pauline Hansen's speech and in particular we know that when she talks about being being swamped there's there are 2.2 percent of Muslims in Australian culture but really fueling her argument last night was her core proposition that there is a fundamental incompatibility between Islam and, the, and, and Australian society. How do you respond to that argument? Um, I think it's pretty obvious that lots of Muslims have contributed a lot to Australian society and have managed to integrate and become you know, part of the fabric of what makes Australia so great. Um, but I think that uh, she focuses on the extremist element within the Muslim communities, which exists and we can't deny, but it's almost equivalent to saying that members, um, because members of the Ku Klux Klan are all white, therefore all white people are bad and should be banned um, or to stop them from being in Australia. So it's, um, it's a bit bizarre and I think it's unfair and I think that makes it really hurtful for a lot of Muslims who are trying very hard to be part of the Australian fabric. So when she says um, Islam doesn't believe in democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, does not separate religion and politics and has a political agenda that goes far outside the realm of religion, is there any truth to any of that? I think that she's conflating Islam with political Islamism or jihadist Islamism, which is very problematic. So I think... We can look at our northern neighbour in Indonesia, they've got democracy, they're the largest Muslim nation in the world uh, and we have um, you know, issues within Muslim communities and, uh, and, and Muslim countries fight with freedom of speech and freedom of expression but we're fighting to try and fix that. It's not because it's incompatible with Islam as a religion but it's because there's, you know, in developing countries there's a corruption and there's a lot of issues that Muslim countries face. Um, so I think that it is compatible and I think a lot of Muslims, especially Muslims from our community with Muslims for Progressive Values are trying really hard to fight for the, you know, the emergence and the um, proliferation of interpretations of Islam that advocate for freedom of speech, freedom of expression and democracy. Um, so I think what, what I'm finding as the president of Muslims for Progressive Values is that the community who believe in those values in Australia is large and very diverse. So we have Muslims from Bosnia, from Indonesia, converts, all who share a similar progressive interpretation of Islam and who are here very much feeling part of Australia. And you're, you're head of a, a group of progressive Muslims who are actively advocating the reform of the more conservative or extreme elements of the religion. How would you describe the nature of that, of, of, of your own fight 
will struggle to do that now. And what kind of impact do the remarks like Pauline Hanson's have upon the work that you're doing? I think Pauline Hanson's remarks make it more difficult for us because obviously, you know, with, with any kind of change within society, you do uh, you, you come up against some form of resistance. Um, but my, my experience generally with the Muslim communities in Australia has been really positive and they've welcomed the progressive movement. The word reform is a little bit difficult because, you know, we have different, um, different terms come loaded with different kinds of meanings and so people prefer renewal or you know people prefer liberal Islam or people moderate Islam but in reality what it really is doing is looking at Islam from the perspective of civil liberties uh, and from the perspective of human dignity and equality and all of those are compatible with Australian values. Mm. Just quickly, uh, Reem, um, there's a perception at least among some parts of the media that one of the biggest problems um, with uh, you know, maybe Islam in Australia is that at the top, um, you know, the Grand Mufti does actually have, you know, um, probably not the, uh, the greatest progressive record. Um, and you are obviously a, um, a shining light amongst the, um, the uh, Islamic community in Australia. What do you think about when you've got people at the top of Islam in Australia who probably aren't that progressive? I think it's a shame, you know, I'm a progressive, so obviously I would like to have progressive people at the top, but I think that it's, uh, we do have quite a conservative community still, and, uh, and that doesn't mean that they're, you know, that we need to, when I say conservative, really be aware that in fact the studies from terrorism research shows that conservatism and terrorism do not correlate, in fact a lot of terrorists are not conservative Muslims and know very little about Islam, so, um, so I think that the the, the fact that the leaders are conservative shouldn't be something that should be an indicator of something to be fearful from. It's just that more work needs to be done in opening up the space for critical thought and critical reasoning within Islam. A lot of these people come from countries where that wasn't available to them. So what, what we're trying to do as an organization is kind of feed that, um, you know, self uh, self um, you know, confidence for them to be able to look at Islam and to identify it within ways that match their values. Reem Swade, always a great pleasure to have you on the drum. Thanks Thank so much you. for joining us tonight. Thanks. Now, something else I want to talk about is the reaction to Pauline Hanson's speech in Canberra too, with all nine Green senators walking out of the chamber. Let's take a look at what the police have had to say about <coughs> Senator Hanson's comments and whether the Greens were right to protest. Why do you stand here and criticise me for standing up to preserve our way of life that we have peace and cohesion on our streets? I will not apologise to you. I will not apologise to anyone. She is entitled to her views. Um, I disagree with many of them, as would other Australians. I think the Greens were disgusting to walk out on Pauline Hanson. What a furphy. I mean, she's an elected senator in the Australian Parliament. Of course she's entitled to a platform. That doesn't mean she's entitled to an audience. The things she asks people to do do not make Australia stronger. Which country in the world has ever become stronger and safer through targeting a group of people because of their ethnicity or their religion? We will not tolerate hate speech. We will not tolerate racism. Outdated, outmoded, um, inaccurate. The thing that we should never claim, we should never claim Pauline Hanson isn't smart. The mistake that was made 20 years ago of trying to demonise her and demonise her supporters should not be repeated. Michael Yabley, do you have any sympathy with those people who walked out? Look, I think it's interesting that the, the left are always, the, the hard left, are always the real champions of the whole notion of freedom of speech. And yet, you know, they're the ones that bring down the shutters. Sure, they're entitled to walk out. They can, they can really do anything they like. And that's one of the great things about Australia. It is as free and open a democracy as you can get. I'm just, I'm always intrigued by the, the, the contradiction that those who champion the notion of free speech are the ones who walk out on the one who's exercising free speech. But, uh, but they're still speech. allowing her to speak. They're just exercising their own sure, right they, to not listen. They, they are. And look, I think, you know, Pauline Hanson, you know how there are some people who, if there are ten ways of saying something, uh, Pauline Hanson is one of those people who will find the most abrasive and offensive way out of the ten maybe of, she's just, of saying... Maybe she's just very blunt. Well, look, she's, she's blunt, but, I mean, but you know, it is, it's pretty clear that Pauline Hanson is now being treated in a different way to the way she was treated um, her first time around. And this is not unrelated to the Trump phenomenon, to the Brexit phenomenon, 
even the um, Filipino presidential election phenomenon and you know, mainstream politicians who may have dismissed Hanson uh, 20 years ago, um, I, I think are now reluctantly um, taking notice and judging from John Howard's comments, I mean, you, you, she, she cannot just be dismissed in the same way as Donald Trump just cannot be dismissed. Mm, but there certainly is a different tenor about n not being dismissed by the mainstream parties. Um, Chris Mitchell, what's your view about, about, about the walkout? Or are we just simply being well, distracted? Look, I, I think there were a lot of mistakes made 20 years ago, and I think Howard's position last night on Late Line about what went wrong 20 years ago is correct. I think she does reflect what a lot of people feel, but I think it's the feeling of ignorance, really. I think it's people who don't know Islamic people. I thought, I thought what Reem said about Islamism versus Islam was pretty correct. And I also think the, the sort of self-defeating uh, part of Pauline's argument is that this is only likely to make young Islamic males, who after all we are really trying to protect from radicalising themselves online, more alienated than they are. So if you talk to ASIO or if you talk to the AFP, that's the big concern. And one of the reasons Malcolm Turnbull is trying to wind down the rhetoric on this issue is to stop kids of 15 and 16 going online and radicalising and then going out and doing something violent. Mm. But Chris, I, I would, I'd be really concerned that, that what is portrayed as the winding down of the rhetoric um, is, is really trying to you know, sugarcoat something that I think most Australians... I mean, Reem referred to the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, that is a, that's a nonsense analogy. The Ku Klux Klan does not threaten us and our way of life and there are not the sort of incidents... Well, we're not really exactly living in North Carolina or something, no, we're, are we? We're, you know, we're, we? we're, we're, we're not. But, you know, I, I think, the, I, I think you know, there, are, there are plenty of people who are trying to sugarcoat what is actually going on in the Islamic world. And the truth is, I mean, the, out of the News Limited stable, I remember it was 15 years ago... The editorial said that that not not all not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorist actions, nearly all terrorist actions, are committed by Muslims. I'm afraid there are inescapable truths in this. But the total, need to be the told. total BS with that, though, Michael, is that yes, a lot of the terrorism committed in Australia is committed by Muslims. But if you look at the victims, quite often, um, you know, around the world terrorist incidents are being committed against other Muslims. You know, this is the, the ISIS ideology is anti-Muslim because they are attacking and killing Muslims. I know we want to move on, but I wouldn't mind saying something either. I think there's a, there's a historical development argument here. So, you know, is Islam as progressed, you know, as we have been since the Crusades? It seems to me I went to school uh, and was educated by nuns who looked a lot like women in burqas. So 50 years ago, you know, things, you know, women who had their face covered were pretty common in Australia. Right, exactly. Just... No, because I want to move on to one more thing that's happened in Federal Parliament today. Look, this has been one of the most controversial elements of Treasurer Scott Morrison's first budget. A half a million dollar cap on after-tax superannuation contributions. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said the changes would make the super system fairer and stuck by them during the election campaign despite a backbench backlash. Can you foresee any circumstance in which the policy as detailed in the May 3 budget will change following the election? Will it, is, no. it, is it ironclad? It is absolutely ironclad, yes. That's the, the commitments that we've made in the, in the budget are, are our policy. And that's what, that's what we, if we are returned, we'll implement those policies. And what a difference three months and a near-death election makes. The ironclad super promises out the window today in favour of a $100,000 annual cap. My question is to the Prime Minister. Today, Senator Abetz issued a press release claiming credit for the Prime Minister's humiliating back down on superannuation. George, angry. Are the extreme elements of his party so powerful that they can force the Prime Minister to abandon his absolutely ironclad promise? So, a government improves a measure, consults, changes it, improves it, makes it work better. In the real world, where all of our constituents live, people say, that's good. They listen. They listen. And they, they tweaked it. They made a change. Good on them. That's great. They're listening to us. It's sensible. But in the pantomime of the 70 minutes of this parallel universe in question time, it's a humiliating backflip. I mean, this is... We have to get real about the art of policy making in this parliament. 
Michael, uh, is the Prime Minister right to draw a distinction between the reaction in the pantomime of federal politics and what he describes as the real world, which were cheering I, I, his decision? Uh, I, I thought the Prime Minister was about to say it was a non-core promise. <laughs> um, <laughs> Look, you know, I, th I think probably the Prime Minister's greatest difficulty with this was that the announcement was made today and not before the 2nd of July. Mm. Um, you know, this, this is an announcement that's been waiting to happen for uh, a long time. The writing was on the wall. It was the, the right one? Yeah, look, I, I, think it, I think it was the right one. I don't think the, the, the fiscal downside is, is so great. Um, but basically, the, the, the announcement is made in something of a political vacuum because, of course, the election has come and gone. Mm. Is it a humiliating back down, do you think, Chris, or is it smart negotiation? I think they've done the right thing. You know, I think the original reforms were correct. You know, super had become too big a lurk, and I think, you know, that goes back to Howard and Costello. And we had real anomalies where people who are on less than, you know, the lowest marginal tax rate paid 15 cents in the dollar if they wanted to top up their contribution. So their rate increased by 15 cents. Mm. So I, think, I think the reforms are good, and I think the... Um, the $500,000 change allows people to top up if they inherit. So people who are reasonably low in the socioeconomic demographics, if they inherit a house late in life in their 50s or 60s, they can top up. Mm. What, do, what do you think? Are we seeing the sign of actually some, some decisive action? The, the worst, the worst thing in politics is when, you, when something happens to you or you actually uh, do an action that actually reinforces a negative perception um, or like your biggest weakness. And one of the biggest weaknesses or a negative perception in the community right now about Malcolm Turnbull is big, he's being pulled to the right by his party, by some members on the far right wing of, 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 the, of that coalition party room. The problem being is that this was probably a very constructive thing that happened today was, you know, they listened to the party. But when you have Erica Betts releasing a media release and you have George Christensen going out and holding a press conference claiming credit, um, again, it just reinforces that negative perception amongst the community that Malcolm Turnbull is being yanked to the right. Do you and think, he... do you think what, what he's describing as the real world would actually take notice of those two press releases as opposed to the oh, fact that I, he's got it off the agenda? The, 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 the issue is, is that quite often most people are going to be um, receiving this information through a 90-second news report tonight. So, the, you know, George Christensen and Erica Betts might not even mm. show up in those, in those reports. But... Uh, you know, this was a red blood issue um, amongst the Liberal Party, um, especially in New South Wales. If you turned on 2GB or if you opened up the newspapers every day, it was, you know, superannuation was the battleground for Conservatives. Um, I think it's very concerning for Malcolm Turnbull going forward that any compromise within his party is going to be um, being claimed by one element of the party when actually he should be claiming credit as Scott Morrison should be today. OK, and something else that's been dogging Malcolm Turnbull has been the question of, well, actually, the, the Coalition, the Liberal Party generally, and also the Labor Party is uh, political donations. Now, Labor Senator Sam Dastyari's demotion has not quelled concern about foreign political donations. In a candid interview earlier this week, outgoing US Ambassador John Berry said the US had been surprised at the extent of the Chinese government's involvement in Australian politics. Today, the Chinese hit back. A spokesman for the embassy said, we noted that some people always love to give lectures. The Chinese government has always opposed any country's interference in the internal affairs of other countries. Chris Mitchell, is this really, could this really have come as a surprise to the Americans? Well, I doubt it. And I do think the Australians you know, are quite capable of you know, walking and chewing gum at the same time. You know, go back to the report on foreign ownership in Australia of land. Um, you know, they only owned less than half a percent of you know, Australian agricultural land. Mm. Seems to me if you know, they're buying a lot of favours with their political donations, it hasn't worked well. The Osgrid sale was only blocked a couple of weeks ago. Me, and yes. you know, back when Labor was in power, they blocked the Chinalco deal to take 16 per cent of Rio. So, it's not a successful strategy for them if, it's, if that's their strategy, the Chinese. Mm. But I, th I think Chris makes a, a very valid point. You know, there is, there is not a whole lot of evidence around to suggest that you know, the, these are, that this money is sort of greasing the wheels that um, is allowing the Chinese or any other uh, foreign investor to do business in, in Australia. But the, the problem is one of perception. Um, I mean, you can say that you know, there might be a 10 out of 10 mark in terms of uh, probity having been observed, that, that does not stop a, a grubby appearance when political do donations are concerned. And I think that really goes to the heart of the, the problem, which is why this, 
as sure as the sun rises in the east, this will keep happening. These scandals will continue. It was Sam Dastiari last week. There will be someone else next week. And until the broom is put through the whole regime of political donations, this will keep happening. OK, describe to us this broom. I know this is something you've been thinking about for some look, time. Is, How, what should this look like this in is both a, parties? This is a subject near and dear to my heart. I mean, right. I've, I've, I've put out a statement saying I believe that there are six points. The first three points are, one, there should be a cap of $500 on donations, which of course is a, a very low level mm -hmm. cap, a very modest amount. Uh, secondly, that um, someone has to be an Australian citizen and on the electoral roll to make a donation, even a donation of $500. And, and thirdly, there should be a prohibition on entities, an entity being a trade union, a public or private uh, company, an industry association, anything that could, falls within the net of an entity. Mm -hmm. So I think they are, and, and I'm, I'm also um, strongly advocating that there should be, and I think this is the great sleeper in this whole issue, uh, abolition of public funding. I mean, this, the, the, the public funding rort that has been going on for three decades, where over time, hundreds of millions of dollars have been pumped into political parties uh, by poor, unwitting taxpayers um, is something that, that really does need to be cleaned out. What do you wish you'd done differently in your time as fundraiser? Well, look, this is... And, and Julia, I mean, I, I have, I've fessed up. I've said, you know, this, this might be a bit of a... Given that I have spent a lot of time in my political career as a fundraiser, there is something of, of uh, poacher turned, turned gamekeeper. I have no difficulty with that. I think there are, you know, we all go through experiences in life where you see something at close range, um, you are part of the machinery that is making it happen, but you don't particularly like the look of it. And I think the, the, the best thing that you can do, if that is how you genuinely feel, is to do something about it when you have the freedom of being out of that position that you don't have when you are actually in that position. Mm, and just, could, could I interrupt? Yes, yes. I just want to say, I thought another point that Michael has made is that forces political parties to actually do more to attract membership. And I think that's actually a healthy thing, isn't it? The parties are now too small in membership to actually be relevant. So if they had to raise their own possible? money... But if they had to raise their own money and that's how they funded their well, campaign... Well, this is... Look, can, I, can I just make this point? The, the person who has done more work on this than probably everyone else put together is Rodney Cavalier, who was Minister for Education in the Rand and, and Unsworth governments. He's the Labor Party historian. He has forensically analysed just... just how, how corrupt the impact of public funding has been on the operation of political parties. Public funding, to a large extent, accounts for the fact that political parties, Liberal Party, Labor Party, National, you can go through the list, they are shells of organisations. They're moribund, and it is only through this radical change to fundraising, as Chris points out, that something will happen that will mm. create meaningful change. Now, something I want to ask you, the, the, the two authors on the panel, um, in this era of, of greater transparency, all for, you know, noble and good ends, in the era of, of an erosion of privacy, we are also noticing changes in reporting and there's been, there's been a lot of commentary around both of your books <laughs> about th th conversations or events or dinner parties um, with dancing prime ministers or, um, Mark, you, you, you start and, and finish your book with scenes from, you know, talking to men at, at urinals mm. who discuss things with you kind of mid, yep. and, mid yes and um, <laughs> and um, but where do, do we draw the line now well I just think that um, in my case I truly believe that um, some people within the Australian political media like to sort of say that everything is off the record until it's on the record mm -hmm. so um, I my approach to reporting the book and my approach to reporting at BuzzFeed is everything is on the record until someone ask if it's off. So if someone says to me, this is off the record, and then I say, OK, it's a negotiation. I say, OK, let's have a chat. And so it becomes off the record. But do you know what it used to be? That's with your sources or with politicians mm. or with people in other positions of power. You're, you're doing that now with your colleagues. Yeah, well, I think that it's more That's like, I mean, it's different. It, so so I, I don't think that, I mean, journalists have to have their own 
code of ethics because there are no rules here because I don't think that, you know, exposing a member of the public to um, this sort of um, aggressive reporting journalism is potentially helpful. I think if it's in the realm of the political arena, staffers, other journalists political politicians themselves, mm. I think that we just have to have, be, have a mature approach. If I'm standing at the back of a press conference and I can overhear a private conversation that directly contradicts what's happening in front of the camera, am I supposed to be duty-bound not to report what I just heard? Because it's actually way more informative than what's happening in front of the camera. And I think that well, that's... that a little bit different? I mean, they're talking loudly in a public space and you're... Well, I, 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 my, my approach to this has always been very hawkish. Yeah. I, I genuinely believe that um, my, my audience is out there, my audience is not inward. OK, and I need to hear from Chris how, how you went through making those decisions as coming from the position of an editor who had, you know, incredible access and relationships with the likes, with all of our Prime Ministers and media proprietors. Yeah, well, I'm, obviously I've retired and most of them have too, but look, I think in my book I'm talking about five Prime Ministers and Rupert Murdoch. I'm not talking about other journos. My view on, you know, source-protected confidentiality is, is, is that it's absolute. But if somebody is, a Prime Minister is ringing me demanding that I sack a particular reporter or pull, some, pull Headley Thomas off a story, for instance, I think that's a reasonable thing to relate in retirement. I also think it's mm. quite it's something that ordinary journos don't know much about. So they know about their own dealings with politicians, but they don't know that the editor who has 300 journos working for him mm. protects them year in and year out from a fate that for them and their families would be worse than death. Nobody is more powerful in this country than a Prime Minister. But, but, Certainly not an and, editor. And yes, it's a gripping read, but what about the <laughs> likes of... You know, Tony Abbott said he was disappointed that you'd well, reveal look, I, all I'd of that. Well, look, I'd ask myself a really serious question, and I will, I will write this next, next week in my column, but I perhaps should have actually revealed that two years ago. When I think about it, I probably agree with Mark on this. Tony Abbott told us and told all of his mentors and other media who said that he should make a change to Joe Hockey, that he had complete mm -hmm. confidence in Joe Hockey. But I found out at the end of 2014 that for 30 years he'd had his own private doubts about Joe's metal. Mm. And he used a sporting analogy too to, yeah. to so, wrap it so up. It's Wouldn't not really a very confidential story, is it? It's about <laughs> university seconds rugby. No, I don't know. I, th I think it's a really interesting blurring. Uh, Michael, we have like 15 seconds, but well, I don't know if I've, you've got a tell all to write. I, for I'm us. the only one on the panel who hasn't written a book this month, anyhow. <laughs> the time um, has look, come. Yeah, I think trust, trust is the key. My life is a fundraiser. <laughs> you could have a oh, yeah. Yes. There's a, yeah, now there's yes. a book. Yes, okay. You can come and tell us about that on the drum. But that's, his, that's, uh, his, that's it for us tonight. Thanks so much, Chris Mitchell, Mike Stefano, Michael Yabsley. Tomorrow night we're talking education with a special show asking whether our school system is best serving students and teachers. See you then.